Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Alexis and it's so good to see you again. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you're all doing well. Um, today, I'd like to take you down to St. Petersburg, Florida for our next case. I'd like to introduce you to Morgan Martin. Morgan was born on the 1st of December in 1994 to her mom, Leah Martin. She also has one sister, Sierra. Her father really wasn't super hands-on in her life. Obviously, she lived in St. Petersburg with her mom and her sister, but her dad actually lived up in Washington at uh, Walla Walla. Uh, Morgan also lived with him for a short period of time before moving back with her mom, but physically, he just, how can he be around, you know? That being said, Morgan was best friends with her mom, Leah. Um, when she would go on sleepovers, she would actually call her mom early to come pick her up so she could be home so she could hang out with her. Uh, she was the type that if she called you and said that she loved you and you didn't say it back, she would call you back until you said it back, which is hilarious. Morgan was the type that always wanted to make people smile. She was super friendly. She always saw the best in people. At 15, Morgan actually ran away for, I mean, literally it sounded like a day. She ended up at a friend's house before she called a relative to come pick her up and returned her home. It really sounded to me like it was more of a, a misunderstanding than anything. Morgan desperately wanted to be a mom. She was, oh, that was her biggest dream. You know, when you asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up, she wanted to be a mom. At the time of this case, it's about 2012, and Morgan had not yet graduated high school. She was actually 17 at the time. She was working at Checkers. Uh, if you don't know what a Checkers is, it's kind of like a, a rallies. Um, they serve a lot of like American food, that type of thing. So on May 18th, 2012, she found out she was pregnant. She was so excited. She was so happy. She was ecstatic. She could not believe it. She just, uh, she was so ready. The way she was so excited, it really put her mom at ease. She was so excited for her. Morgan found out she was pregnant with a little girl. Oh, so excited. And she actually named her. Her name was Julia Raquel. Oh, I love it. But unfortunately, not everybody was as excited as Morgan was. On July 25th, about two months after Morgan had found out that she was pregnant, uh, she told her sister Sierra that she was going out to meet with what she would call or refer to as baby daddy. The plan was that he was going to stop over the house. Um, he wasn't going to stop over until late, like midnight and Morgan needed to talk to him about the pregnancy and what their plans were. On that way out of her house last night, she only had her phone and the clothes on her back. She didn't have a sonogram. She didn't have her purse, her ID, money, nothing. She also told her sister Sierra to please don't lock the door. She was going to be right back. Just a quick talk with him and she was gonna come back inside. She really wasn't dressed to be gone long either. She had on a white tank top, a pink hoodie, some gray sweatpants, and just her house slippers. So it doesn't seem like she was planning on really even leaving the house. So the next morning at 5 a.m. when Leah got up, she saw that Morgan's room light was on and her air conditioning was still on. So she thought nothing of it. She just assumed that Morgan was in her room. So when Leah did finally check her room, Morgan wasn't there. She was nowhere to be found. And Leah was upset, obviously. Um, she was calling Morgan, texting Morgan, telling her to give her a call. And Morgan never did. So after Leah's calls went unanswered, it's obviously concerning because Morgan was on her phone all the time. And she was like a typical teenager, always on her phone, checking social media. And she wasn't the type to just ignore her mom really either. I mean, they talked several times a day. So then as more people tried to get in contact with Morgan, it was more and more unsettling. She didn't reply to any Facebook messages, text messages, nothing, which is super unlike Morgan. So Leah and Sierra did eventually end up reporting her missing to the police. So now let's talk about baby daddy, Jacoby Flowers. Jacoby Rashad Flowers was born on December 12th, 1987, making him 24 at the time of Morgan's disappearance. One source said he was born in Kansas City, 
but that's unconfirmed. Eventually, he ended up in Alabama with his mom and his dad, but at around the age of six, his parents were going through a divorce. Jacoby's maternal grandmother actually let him live with her for a year while his parents figured out all the divorce and finished up their business in Alabama. After all of the divorce was settled and everything was figured out, his mom actually moved in with him and his grandmother in Florida, and they lived together, all three of them, for about two years. He then lived with his mom and sister for about two years before finally moving out on his own at around 18. According to his mom, he was a good kid. He didn't get in trouble and he didn't talk back. He had two daughters with uh, a woman named Kwanzaa Smith. And in between those two daughters, he had one daughter with a woman named Jasmine Randall. He was actually 18 years old when he had his first daughter. During this time, Jacoby was a shift manager at a KFC and he actually had to move locations because he started dating an employee while he was a shift manager. I guess you could qualify Jacoby as kind of like a player. He dated around, never really put labels on a relationship, which is what it is. So then Jacoby actually met Morgan on Facebook when she was 16. They had definitely had a sexual relationship, but were not exclusive at all. So that's a problem for two reasons. Jacoby was actually dating a woman named Ricky Holly. Um, they started dating in March of 2011 before actually moving in together uh, December of 2011. During this time, he was talking to Morgan, having sex with Morgan, and as far as we know, Ricky Holly had no idea. Secondly, and most importantly, the age difference between Morgan and Jacoby. Morgan was 16 at the time. And Jacoby was 23. That's disgusting. I'm sorry, Jacoby knows better. Not Morgan's fault, but you? The laws around statutory in Florida are a little interesting. Um, a lot of states have this, but it is what's called the Romeo and Juliet law. Minors 16 and older can only consent to somebody that is four years older at the time of the offense. So if you are 16 years old in the state of Florida, you can have sex, you can have consensual sex with somebody that is 20 years old. Jacoby's 23. Long story short, he could be charged with statutory in the state of Florida. On May 2nd and May 15th of 2012, before Morgan had found out that she was pregnant, Jacoby and Morgan met up. Now we're not sure exactly what happened during this meeting, but we can assume. So then on May 18th, when Morgan actually found out she was pregnant, these are some of the text messages that happened on that day. Jacoby says, you have your whole life for this. Don't do this to me. Morgan says, please, Kobe, just consider it. I love you. There's nothing to consider. This will show me how much you love me. I'm telling you, if you only think about you in this, we will never be the same. Pretty clear as to what Jacoby feels about Morgan being pregnant. Um, the next day after those text messages were exchanged, Jacoby actually picked up Morgan for work and they talked on the way there. Morgan then sent Jacoby a, a sonogram of the ultrasound. She told him that it was a little girl and the name that she had picked out, but Jacoby wasn't interested. He did not want her to keep this baby. Jacoby had actually asked Morgan several times to just terminate the pregnancy and let's just pretend that our relationship never happened. We'll just keep this all a secret. Morgan didn't want that. She wanted a baby so bad. She wanted to keep this baby 100,000% without a doubt in her mind. Morgan then decided that she needed to do something. So she told Jacoby that he could step up as a father, pay child support, or she was going to go the, to the police and report that he was having sex with a minor, which he was which he was. So I really think this is where Jacoby starts to feel like he is being backed into a corner. It probably feels like there's no way out. So much so that Jacoby offered one of his old classmates who also knew Morgan, he offered her money to beat up Morgan. I mean, that never happened, but geez, it's a, little, it's a bit much, don't you think? So Jacoby had a thing for buying burner phones from a local Dollar General. Jacoby bought so many burner phones that they actually like recognized him 
and they put up a limit on how many burner phones you could buy because he was buying so many phones in one shot. Like he would buy like five, six phones and then they'd be gone, like cleared out. On July 24th, uh, at around 9 p.m., Jacoby actually calls Morgan on one of these burner phones. It was actually the first time he had used that phone, even though he had purchased it weeks in advance. And he told Morgan that he was in Fort Lauderdale for a semi-pro football game and that he would meet up with her once he got back into town. When detectives eventually talked to the coach of the semi-pro football team that Jacoby was on, it turns out that there was nothing going on that day. They didn't have a game, they didn't have practice, literally nothing. So that was a lie, that's lie number one. Morgan also told their family too that baby daddy was coming over and everybody everybody knew what that meant, they know who that was. But she also did tell her family that he had a semi-pro game that night. Um, and that becomes important later. And Morgan actually did tell her family that she was excited to talk to Jacoby. She wanted to talk about the pregnancy and she wanted to talk about the baby. She really, she really just wanted Jacoby to be part of her baby's life. And can you blame her? That night, Jacoby was actually just working his regular shift at the KFC that he was the shift manager at. Jacoby then texted his girlfriend, Ricky, and uh, he obviously used his regular phone, regular phone plan. And this was right after his call with Morgan off of the burner phone that he had gotten. And he had told his girlfriend that there was a small issue. Um, he had to get the girls for like an hour. Their babysitter got sick and that he would pick her up after work, after her shift. And then he loved her. Pretty crazy. People are wild. It's crazy to me that you can tell your girlfriend that you love her even though you're gonna go meet up. You get it. So Jacoby was actually the last person out of the KFC and as the shift manager, he is supposed to lock the door with his own specific alarm code, which he didn't do. Jacoby also offered to stay late at work, which was a testimony of one of the other employees that had worked a shift that night with him. So Jacoby then called Morgan at 12.30 a.m. And that's when Morgan's sister, Sierra, said that she left the house. A neighbor actually saw Morgan getting into Jacoby's white Lexus car that he had. And Morgan was never seen again. It is speculated by the police that Morgan was strangled by Jacoby um, since no blood or other evidence was found in his vehicle. It is believed that Jacoby shut off Morgan's phone after he killed her. Jacoby's cell phone records on his regular cell phone through AT&T then showed him going back to his house before leaving at around 1.20 a.m. Jacoby then headed back to the KFC that he works at at around 1.40 a.m. At around 2.30 in the morning, um, a large amount of smoke is caught on the CCTV inside of the KFC. Jacoby tried his best to not get caught on camera, but at around 2.50, there was a reflection of his caught. Now what this whole large cloud of smoke that was caught on CCTV was, it's assumed and speculated that Jacoby was trying to get rid of evidence. And there is evidence that he lit something on fire. There was soot up the walls. There was a greasy texture all over the cooler, presumed to be a fire extinguisher. All of the chicken is normally stacked by date. So you use the oldest stuff first. And when employees came back the next day, the chicken was no longer in order, if that makes sense. So it's speculated he took all that chicken out, burnt something, tried to clean it up with a hose and a fire extinguisher before eventually putting all of the chicken back. Another employee actually stated that Jacoby was furiously scrubbing the floor the next day. His cell phone then left the KFC at around 3.15 in the morning before arriving then at Kwanzaa Smith's house, the mother of two of his daughters. In later interviews with police, Kwanzaa had stated that the only reason why Jacoby would be at her house or be in contact with her at that time would be to either borrow money or to ask if he could borrow her car. 
His phone was then pinged back at the KFC he worked at around 4.30, and then it was pinged in Pasco County uh, on State Road 54, after which his phone was shut off and turned back on at around 8.27 in the Brandon area. Brandon is a little bit of just a rural community, and actually when detectives had went out there to investigate the area in which his phone pinged, they found a fresh hole dug. Not only did they find a fresh hole, they also found a shovel and it was all essentially right off of the interstate, off of I-75. It's kind of speculated that he attempted to dig a hole before realizing how hard it would actually be to dig a grave and then he gave up. That's all speculation. At around 8.50 a.m., Jacoby was then spotted on CCTV um, heading north on the Sun's Sunshine Skyway returning to St. Petersburg. And then at around 10.50, Jacoby returned home. At 11.26 the same day, Jacoby then called AT&T to try and get his number changed. After he returned home, it's then also speculated that he possibly burned some more evidence. There was black garbage bags and charred debris found in the backyard of his home. Morgan's phone last pinged in the Hudson, Florida area, um, where interestingly enough, Jacoby's girlfriend, Ricky, has family. Hmm, interesting. After Morgan was discovered missing by Leah and Sierra, um, Leah actually went down to the KFC that he worked at and left a card with her phone number on it before also taking down Jacoby's plate number. He actually activated another burner phone to call Leah, uh, Morgan's mom, on the same day. Leah and Sierra then went to Jacoby's home where they dropped off missing persons flyers and they ran into Ricky Holly there. They asked her if they knew, if she knew Morgan and she denied ever knowing of her at all. Sierra also claimed that she noticed a balled up blanket just sitting on the floor of their home, which she found kind of unusual. Ricky then called uh, Keith Rutledge, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but she called him over to come over to the home that she and Jacoby shared because Morgan's family was over and Jacoby wasn't there, and apparently she felt really uncomfortable. Keith told detectives that by the time he arrived, uh, Morgan's family was already gone, and Ricky told Keith that Jacoby wanted Ricky to lie to the police about his whereabouts at the time of Morgan's disappearance. Jacoby allegedly told Ricky that if the police ask, he was picking up Ricky at the time of Morgan's disappearance. So that same day, uh, the police got into contact with Jacoby and interestingly enough, he gave them the burner phone number that he had just activated instead of his regular AT&T number that he had just changed that morning. He did tell detectives that he knew of Morgan, he knew her from Facebook, but he wasn't having a sexual relationship with her and he had no idea who the father of her baby was. Jacoby also stated that any messages between Morgan and himself uh, talking about the pregnancy was them playing make-believe. Sure. Three days later, Jacoby met with detectives again, and uh, he denied ever meeting with Morgan the night that she disappeared. He also stated that he unfriended her two months ago on Facebook because she kept saying that he was the father of her child, even though that was untrue. He said that he had not had sex with Morgan, but he did admit to playing around with her. When asked when the last time he spoke to Morgan, he said it was a couple of weeks ago on Facebook, but we know that's a lie obviously. Detectives then asked Jacoby about the trip to Fort Lauderdale that he took uh, the day before or right before Morgan had went missing and he said that he had went, he had gone, but then detectives asked how would Morgan's family know that and he didn't have an answer. He just shrugged his shoulders. Mm -hmm. When detectives asked him if he had talked to Morgan on the way to or from Fort Lauderdale, he said that he had chatted to her on Facebook. So already his story not matching up. Mm, sorry, Jacoby, something's not right here. On the same day that they were doing this interview with Jacoby, they had asked him if they could search his vehicle, uh, which he complied. When they went to search his trunk, though, they noticed that the trunk mat covering the spare tire was gone. And 
the rest of the trunk besides where the trunk mat should be was dirty full of garbage and debris but the area around the tire was clean which doesn't make sense that doesn't add up when they asked jacoby about the trunk mat essentially he said that it was sold without one so then detectives went on to ask the previous owner if they sold the trunk mat with the lexus and the previous owner said that they had what's also interesting is Jacoby's white Lexus was actually searched in 2011 uh, by the police and they literally have a photo of the trunk mat in there. <laughs> so detectives knew you did something with the trunk mat. It's gone. It's not here. So the same day they're doing all this with Jacoby about three days after Morgan's disappearance. They sit down with Jacoby's girlfriend Ricky and um they had kind of asked her about her whereabouts that night. She told detectives that she had worked until midnight. Um, she arrived home at around 12.15 and Jacoby was already there. She says that she had made Jacoby go to McDonald's after she had arrived home and about 10 minutes later he came back with food. So obviously police are going to check the surveillance cameras at that McDonald's, which they did. They never saw Jacoby. They never saw his white Lexus. And when Ricky was confronted with this, she essentially said that Jacoby never went to McDonald's. Uh, she doesn't remember any of the nights around Morgan's disappearance. And she denies lying, even though she was never accused of it. The next time Jacoby had met with detectives, his story changed again. He told the detectives that he had not talked to Morgan within the last three to four months. When asked about the day leading up to Morgan's disappearance, he said that he had picked up his Lexus from a local repair shop before heading to KFC where he worked until 10 p.m. Instead of his previous alibi where he told the detectives that he was at his semi-pro football game in Fort Lauderdale. He said that he then went home to take a shower before picking up Ricky from work at around midnight before they both headed back home. On the way home, Jacoby then says that he was telling Ricky about this pregnant girl spreading lies about him that he was the father of her baby and that other people were also spreading that rumor. He then told detectives that he stayed home until 1.30 before heading out to a local nightclub. He then said that he stayed out until about 3.30 a.m. before finally arriving home at around 4 a.m. When they pointed out all the discrepancies in Jacoby's story, he essentially said, you must be mistaken. I." I never said that. Detectives then met up with the general manager at the nightclub who explained that the club closes at 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. sharp. So all of the patrons have to be out by 2.45 a.m. And the security at this nightclub, off-duty Tampa police. So detectives then go to Ricky Holly's work and they find her time card, which states that she got off work at around 11 not midnight, which I know these little discrepancies maybe aren't the biggest deal, like what's an hour, but it's just all these little lies that are just adding up. Ricky's phone records actually uh, show she did not get home at 1215, like she said, and she was never in the same vicinity as Jacoby during that whole night. She had actually tried calling him nine times that night between 1.30 and 8.30 a.m., he did answer a couple of times that a majority of these calls went unanswered. It's crazy to me that it's like Jacoby has all of these women wrapped around his finger. Like Ricky is lying for him. In the de deposition that uh, Jasmine Randolph gave, she was just a dick. She was just mean the whole time. Snarky, short, would not give the detectives anything. I just think it's crazy that, you know, Kwanzaa Smith, Jasmine Randolph, Ricky Holly, they really all have his back. They're lying for him. Kwanzaa Smith really gave detectives no information either. Jacoby actually has domestic violence charges against him from one of his mothers of his children. He's not a good guy. I think he's just that manipulative. I don't know. It's crazy to me that he can get away with that. So years later, uh, Jacoby actually 
gave an interview to ABC Action News and it was a freaking mess. I mean, he really tried to deny it, but it's just not convincing. On March 15th of 2015, uh, the St. Pete Police Department actually uh, created a new cold case unit. Over the next 13 months, police really renewed interest in Morgan's case. They reanalyzed evidence, they collected new evidence, they re-interviewed uh, witnesses, they interviewed new witnesses. They put in a lot of work afterwards into this cold case. Now with not only the ATF, uh, also the FBI got involved. On August 1st of 2015, Jacoby was actually uh, arrested by the police uh, for fleeing and eluding. Um, he was then booked into Avon Park Correctional Institute. So in March of 2016, Jacoby was actually convicted of fleeing and eluding and was charged to one year and one day in jail with credit for time served. So Jacoby would be getting out uh, on July 1st of 2016. So now police are racing against the clock because they don't want him to get out. On June 23rd of 2016, right before he's supposed to get out of jail, I mean days before, we're getting down to the wire, he was indicted on first degree murder of Morgan Martin. Jacoby first pled not guilty, but then on April 1st of 2022, Jacoby accepted a plea deal. That essentially means that you waive your right to a jury trial. You essentially go up for sentencing. With this plea deal, Jacoby had two weeks to lead them to the body of Morgan Martin. He would be sentenced to 25 years if he would comply. And if he did not, he would be sentenced to 40 years in prison. A judge essentially signed an order for Jacoby to get out of prison so he could lead them to her body. And on April 4th, they began the search for Morgan. Jacoby took them into Alabama, into Pike County, where he took them to a farm. It was about 50 acres and it was just cotton fields. By April 8th, essentially police had to suspend their search when cadaver dogs, excavators, anthropologists could not find Morgan's body. And unfortunately, by April 15th, Morgan had not been found. On April 28th, Jacoby was finally up for sentencing. Morgan's family was at sentencing for Jacoby and they all wore t-shirts with Morgan's face on them. Uh, and they're still really hopeful that maybe one day she will eventually be found. During sentencing, uh, Leah essentially ripped Jacoby a new hole that he definitely deserved. She was my child. She was my daughter and she was so good hearted. Leah Martin's emotions ranged from uncontrolled grief to rage. And I hope that every day that you sleep, you have to see her. Do you understand me? I hope you see her face. Those emotions have been building for about a decade. And as she stared in court at Jacoby Flowers, the man being sentenced for murdering her daughter, Morgan Martin, who was 17 years old and pregnant with their child, Morgan's mother couldn't hold back. You didn't only kill my child, you killed your own. You're worthless. Jacoby was then sentenced to 40 years in prison with credit for time served without the possibility of parole. And Leah makes a great point. Let's not forget that he also killed his own unborn child. And her family still holds out hope that she will be found. And, you know, I'm not saying let's go out with some shovels or anything like that. But what I am saying is if, if you know anything, uh, even if you think it's irrelevant, I will leave links or phone numbers, things like that in the description below where you can hopefully submit what you know to police. Uh, my biggest hope for videos like these is essentially just to bring awareness um, because that's what I want for these people. I mean, I can't imagine you have the evidence, you have the guy behind bars, but you just can't find her body. And and obviously, either A, he doesn't remember, or B, he's not telling. And that's got to be an awful feeling. Leah is now an advocate for missing uh, children. Uh, she's always on Facebook posting about these kids, which, you know, honestly, I really feel for her. I get it. Um, you want to do your best and you want to help these other people too, because it's just an awful thing that you go through. It's terrible. I feel so bad for these people. But uh, unfortunately, that's where this case sits right now. There's really, 
I mean, there's justice, but there's no resolution as to where she is. Really hope you enjoyed this video. Um, it's really awful to hear, especially about somebody who's a baby themselves, you know, only 17 years old and she has a baby and he did something like this to her. But I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and stay safe out there. Bye guys.